adjusting hay equipment to minimize field losses portion here of the Kentucky Alfalfa and Stored Forage Conference. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting New Holland to be part of the conference. My name is Phil Eby. I'm the New Holland Global Product Manager for our crop preparation products. And joining me today is Jordan Maleski. He's the New Holland Product Marketing Manager also for the crop uh, preparation products. Uh, we've been working together for quite a few years and both of us have a passion for the hay and forage industry. We've had the privilege of visiting many producers on the farms, at farm shows and at other events. And that's really one of the most fun uh, parts of this job. For today's presentation, we're gonna walk through the haymaking process from cutting to storage, provide tips on machine setup and things to look for and think about, and hopefully provide some entertainment for you as well. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jordan. Thanks, Phil. Uh, as Phil said, uh, I'm the crop prep guy for North America at North New Holland. I like to think of myself as the disc flying guy. So that's my, my first forte and what I've done for the majority of my career. So uh, bear with me. We may be a little bit disc flying heavy on the presentation. So uh, let's first start talking with a little bit about preservation. That we make hay because we need to secure it for the time later on in the season when there's not going to be so much to sell or to use for animal feed. And nothing influences quality as much as time does. As time goes on, quality goes down with your crop, either an over maturity or mechanical risks or respiration metabolic processes. Certainly the risk of rain is probably the biggest thing that producers fight with on a, on a cutting to cutting basis. And the amount of losses that come from rain are, are more than substantial. So the, probably the most important thing that you can do to minimize losses and improve your quality is to reduce the amount of time. So a lot of what I hear from producers uh, when I do talk to them uh, is that it, it's, it's a lot wetter than what it used to be. It feels like it's harder to make hay than what it, what it once was. And, and we do hear that an awful lot out there. And there's an, any number of things that you can do. Certainly the weather has changed. It's not the same as it was when I was a, when I was a boy, but there's a lot that you can do and influence to make, maybe reduce that drying time quite a bit and certainly reduce your field losses at the same time. <clears throat> Let's begin by talking about cutting. So this was a study done some, some years back in Marshfield, Wisconsin, that was done in alfalfa and it showed relative feed value versus cutting height. The higher you cut, the better the quality. Now in alfalfa, you have to remember that the, the plant itself, the stem is not where the value is, that's in the leaf. So introducing more stem in each bale means the quality, relatively speaking, goes down. Now, the other thing that comes with that is the lowness of cut height. The lower you cut, the more ash you're gonna include in that bale product at the end of the day, which is also gonna erode your quality. Beyond that, cutting too low can actually reduce regrowth and actually damage future yields. So it used to be the old adage, cut as low as you can, get every ton off the field, and get it in the barn, was the way that most folks thought about haymaking when it came to cutting height. I think today more and more folks are realizing throughout the entire season, they can actually harvest greater yields by leaving a little bit behind in the form of cutting height because the plant's better able to regenerate. Generally, alfalfas and clovers, those, those wetter, diff more difficult, low-growing plants, we'd say to cut about two inches. Typically, grass haze, we recommend cutting up as high as three inches, and a mixed stand is sort of the balance between the two. Now, what's interesting to me is our most popular machine at New Holland is our Dispine 210. That's our 10-foot side pole machine. The roll version being the most popular variant of that product. Now, it has a maximum cutting height of about two and a half inches. Now, a lot of grass hay producers out there that I talk to really do want to cut them a whole lot higher because they understand cutting too low is going to really stunt the regrowth. Now, for those folks that want to cut at three, four, five, and as high as six inches high in some cases, I usually recommend that they try 
these additional raised skid shoes. It's a nice option that you can put on your machine and it'll give you the versatility to very quickly change between cutting very low when you need to and cutting very high when it's the best thing to do for your plant stands. So those are available and they're out there. A lot of different companies have raised skid shoes out there. So if you want to cut a little bit higher to really drive that regrowth, that's certainly something to look at. Now, <clears throat> I talked about quality in ash, right? So the old adage is cows do not like sand in their salad. So cutting height plays a big part in that simply because you're putting less ash into it. But machine design will actually play a part as well. A more modern machine will have a tendency to put less ash in, the, in that windrow simply because the header is better able to follow and track the ground. But likewise, if it's putting less ash into the hay because the, the knives are better able to follow those contours, um, it's also going to maintain a more consistent cut height, especially in higher speeds and in rolling terrains, which is going to really protect your, your machine, protect your crop, and, and make sure you have the best quality. Uh, a recent advent for some, uh, for us, we've had quick change knives now for a number of years, the quick change knife feature. Producers absolutely love this feature on any mower conditioner because it gives them the, the opportunity to change knives in literally seconds. Now, I personally like the quick change knife feature, not because of the ability to change knives easily, but for the ability to be able to select an alternate knife. Now, in later season cuttings in particular, our blades that we ship with our machines from the New Holland factory are 14 degree angle. That's an, a heck of a lot of angle and a lot of lift that you just don't need in lighter, later cuttings. Now, that being said, you can take off those blades very, very easily and, and swap them out for a, a shallower seven degree angle, which has about half the lift and about half the angle, and it'll bring less debris into the field. Now, I point out that lift piece because there's a lot of turbulence that goes on underneath the mower conditioner. And if you have too much turbulence, you can actually blow the crop down in front of the cutter bar, which means you're leaving a whole bunch behind. You're having significant field losses. Certainly, if you have a duller damaged knife, you're going to be leaving strips of uncut crop. That's going to be field losses. So being able to change your knives easily and without the excuse of, I didn't have a wrench to do it, I think quick change knives are probably one of the most important things for making sure that you're cutting at a consistent, clean um, height throughout. Now, in lighter late season crops, Phil, what do we generally recommend to folks when it comes to, uh, to cutting late season crops? Well, another thing you can do is slow your tractor engine speed down and gear up. So gear up, throttle down, and basically that's going to slow your disc speed down, which reduces turbulence. Um, it's going to use less power and less fuel as well. And um, also it's less wear and tear on your machine. So really it's an all around, uh, it's an all around win. And um, a lot of times, uh, you know, especially later season, like Jordan said, you know, it's a thinner stand. Um, you don't need all that power um, or all that speed of the discs uh, to cut the crop. Um, so it can be a real advantage for you to uh, just slow that engine speed down. Yeah, and that's that's a real sound piece of advice. And basically it works by simply presenting more crop to the blade and allowing the blade to cut more efficiently, you know, for that reason alone. So it's good sound advice. So there's a whole bunch of things that when it comes right down to it that you as producers can control just with the cutter bar, just with the speed, just with the knife selection. But I would imagine I caught probably some of your attention talking about quick change knives. And since there's an awful lot of older New Holland machines out there, probably my most common farm show question, Bill, has got to be, can I put quick change knives on my 1411 or my H7000? Well, generally, while I enjoy the quick change knife feature as much as anybody, I don't generally recommend that. If you remember, I, I did mention the, the change in rotation. The new Dispine 210, for example, has an up and back geometry, which better protects the knife in the first place. So the knife is better protected to begin with. To me, that's a real game changer. Um, it can actually save you from needing to change the knives, which I think is an important takeaway. Um, on a 1411 or an H7000, the header has to move vertically first, which can present a real challenge. 
to the to the quick change type system. So for that reason alone, I don't generally recommend it. So worn out cutting parts. So you can see in this picture uh, of a, of a trade in unit at a dealership um, that knife is pretty well shot. Um, to me, it looks like it's been flipped at least once and based on the grind on the evil, I, bevel, I uh, feel I'm, I'm fairly certain someone took a grinder to that and sharpened it up at one point. Yeah, it looks yeah, like somebody looks definitely like got the uh, maximum life out of these knives. Yeah, and we point that out simply because, you know, from a standpoint of clean cutting, replacing your knives and, and managing um, your suspension properly is absolutely critical. You know, Phil, maybe you want to say a few words on on the suspension settings of, of headers. Sure, the, the flotation setting um, for the head is is really critical. And and so pretty much every machine out there has some type of, of spring system, uh, some type of system that uh, lowers the amount of ground pressure um, that the cutter bar has on the ground. And, and um, it's really critical to adjust it when you uh, switch your mower conditioner to another tractor or when you change the cutting height. Uh, really, you need to go out there and uh, lift up on the ends of the cutter bar um, on the head. Uh, lift each end and uh, generally uh, it should be around 120 pounds. Um, depending on the machine could be up to 150. Uh, but if you if you go out there and uh, you can't lift it, it's probably too heavy. And um, when you adjust it properly, it's going to reduce the um, wear on the bottom of the cutter bar. Um, also protects the, the cutter bar um, so that when you do a, encounter an obstruction, it's going to uh, allow the cutter bar to, to just lift up and over that obstruction uh, rather than causing some kind of damage. So uh, cutter bar flotation setting is, is definitely one of the critical settings on these machines. Oh, thanks, Phil. Now, the picture on the right is a picture of a, a lifter. So it's that, that cast wedge that you'll see on a New Holland Machines disc. Some other companies have similar components. They may call them crop accelerators, for example. But the reason I have a picture of this of this lifter is, is fairly straightforward. It's a very heavy, well-manufactured component. Uh, they tend to wear very, very little, but over extended periods of time. Now, the function of a lifter is to help move the crop from the cutter bar up and into the rolls. And as those components wear and they lose their effectiveness, if crop isn't moving very swiftly into the rollers, it ends up being recut by the cutter bar, which significantly impacts your field losses, because certainly if you recut and you recut and you recut, every time you cut, you lose a little bit. Now, for folks that are, aren't sure about the wear and tear, because they can really get away from you. Uh, I usually recommend that, you know, if you're concerned because you have an older machine, that you go to your dealership and you get a, a lifter component from service parts and compare it to the one that's on your machine currently. You'll very quickly be able to visually tell how much wear and tear those components have, and you'll know if it's time to change them. So worn conditioning parts. So this is that same machine. Uh, you can obviously look and see that that uh, well, the bigger profile it's 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 not uh, it's not had a very nice life. It certainly hasn't been as well maintained as it as it could have. And you can see in the picture on the right hand side that the rollers are dramatically interfering with one another. One lug is, is riding up on another and has significantly worn the corner completely off. You can see the other lug contacting the valley that's adjacent to it. You can, you can see that surface has certainly been compromised. So as crop moves through rollers that are, that are misadjusted and misaligned like this machine is, since there's no clearance between the, each roller, it will have a tendency to basically tear and shred at that, at that material, which is gonna increase your field losses fairly dramatically. I might also add that when they touch like this and interfere like this, not only do they wear, it significantly increases the horsepower consumption of the machine, which means it takes more fuel for you to run it. So you're losing more crop through field losses and you're spending more time and fuel to actually harvest that crop. So it's pretty important to make sure that your conditioning system is properly adjusted for that reason alone. 
Now, if you have an older machine and you have a, a brand new machine and you want to know how how worn out the rolls are, generally I, I tell people this. Uh, get your wallet out. They usually think I'm saying go buy new rolls, but that's not the case. Uh, get your wallet out, pull out a credit card and compare it to the lug on your roller. If you have an older New Holland machine and you want to understand how worn your lugs are, a credit card is, is pretty much the ideal measuring gauge to be able to, to gauge the amount of wear. You can obviously see that poorly maintained machine has a pretty significant amount of, of lug wear. And in, the, in that case, having lost that corner, it's never going to do as good a job as a new roll is it's lacking that ability to really bend and crack the stem as efficiently as it could have. <clears throat> so some of the other big questions that I get is I've always had rubber, but I hear there's other things and there and there's curiosity about other types of rollers that are out there. Um, but it comes down to it. It doesn't matter if it's a steel roll or if it's a rubber roll. All roll machines essentially have three basic adjustments. That's roll pressure. That's the squeezing force of, in our case, a torsion bar system that applies pressure downward on the crop mat as it goes through the rollers. And then there's roll gap and roll timing. Roll gap and timing, I like to think of like in a gearbox, gear lash and gear timing. Now, if you have the lash set wrong in a gearbox, obviously the horsepower goes up and, and you can hear the noise that it makes. In the case of gap, if the rolls are too far apart, you're not sufficiently crushing and cracking the stems. And if the timing is wrong, you're wearing out the rolls, taking more horsepower, and certainly increasing your field losses through that, that shredding action. So there's three basic adjustments to any roll machine, and that really doesn't matter what color the paint is. Now, from an adjustment standpoint, the two that most people don't really in, in, intuitively get are um, gap and timing. Now this is showing adjusting the gap on a machine. So you can see I have a roll pin punch about an eighth of an inch. It's the diameter of a rough stem and I'll use that as a gauge like I'm setting the gap on a spark plug and simply move it between the two surfaces of the rollers and then have someone adjust the, the roll gap stop bolt on the outside of the machine and once I tell them it's, it's, in, it's in a good place they can simply lock it in place and then it's, it's usually good to go. Now I'll check the roll gap in the, in the right and the left and in the center, roll the machine over so that I have the rolls 180 degrees apart, check it again, just so I make sure that I have a good average dimension across the whole profile of the roller itself. Adjusting the timing, you can see in this image that while the gap is, is pretty well spawned on on this machine, the two, the lugs are, are just a little bit at a time. And on a New Holland machine, the easy way to fix that is to, to get a helper like a Phil or, or someone else, open up that side door. And if you look in by the belt drive that actually turns the roller drive, there's a couple drive shafts that run from the gearbox over to the individual rolls. And they actually have an adjustment right there on the drive shaft that lets you turn the roll separate of the, of the drive shaft. So if I crawl into the machine and do the dirty work, Phil, and I set the, set the timing appropriate, it's very easy for Phil then as I hold the roll to lock up that hardware and make sure that that adjustment stays set. I generally tell folks that, you know, between cuttings, it's only, it only takes a minute to crawl under there and take a peek, to crawl under that machine between cuttings and take a look at those adjustments, because if you have a rock or something come through your rollers, it can certainly impact the timing performance. Um, as far as different types of conditioners, the difference really is in the shape of the roll and the, and the type of lug that it has. Rubber rolls have a big broad surface for being able to more effectively crush stem whereas steel rolls have a tendency to basically pinch and fold the stem so generally i recommend the rubber roll for legumes and, and delicate crops whereas if you're doing a very uh, thick stemmed or fibrous uh, hay crop i would recommend a, a steel roll in that case because they tend to be more abrasive abrasive crops in the first place and when the, that material goes through the steel roll and it's bent at a very uh, a sharp angle they'll tend to split along the fibers as well now, if you're doing a pure grass hay stand, so you have nothing really mixed with it, it's uh, a Bermuda grass or something like that, then a flail type machine is a really nice conditioning system and it can save a few dollars in the front side and still give you good effective drying. And you're certainly not going to be worried about leaf loss in those types of crops. Um, bringing us to leaf loss. So this was a study we did with the University of Wisconsin back in 2011 and it wasn't an alfalfa stand. So you can see that the leaf loss between rubber and steel in a pure alfalfa stand was really negligible. It really, it really didn't amount to much. Now, 
the foil tine had significantly greater leaf loss. And this is the main reason why we don't recommend flail tines in alfalfa, and we try to limit that to grass. Um, saving time, that, that first discussion point that we talked about. When you're trying to save time in haymaking, drying the crop, basically going from being cut to being in a bale, getting it dry to the right moisture level is probably the biggest thing you can do to save time. Now, this is an example of second cutoff alpha at about 30% bloom. We did a number of different uh, a number of different examples of this when we did the study, and they all pretty much came out with the same result. The rubber roll dried significantly faster than I would say the uh, the other conditioning systems initially, and then continued on that pace. Every 24 hours, it was sampled to be well ahead of you know the steel roll, the tine, and you know, certainly non-conditioning uh, treatments of that material. So the rubber roll really did dry faster. Now you'll see in the box below, it, it defines really that the, uh, the rubber roll clearance was 0.8 to 1.5 millimeters, so pretty tight. So the reason those are disclosed here is because that goes back to the importance of making sure that everything is adjusted properly, because a misadjusted conditioner will certainly not produce these results. Now, reed canary grass is not the, not your typical grass, but it is, does tend to be a, a, a more stemmy, fibrous type of grass. So we use this as an example of, of those types of crops um, in the study. Now, you can see, interestingly enough, that rubber was ahead on, on, on day one, uh, several hours after cutting, but not by, by near as much. On day two, by two o'clock in the afternoon, steel and rubber had basically achieved the same drying point and no conditioning had achieved the same dry point as the flail tine conditioning. It's an interesting way to, to look at it. The, uh, the steel rolls, I think, did a really nice job here in this crop in catching up because, again, that fibrous stemmy material going through steel rolls being bent causes the, the stemmy fibrous plant to split, basically creating um, a point for moisture to escape very, very readily from the plant. Let's talk hay in a day for just a moment. The effects of wide swathing versus narrow swathing, I think are, are fairly well understood today. A lot of you folks probably have plain three-point mounted disc mowers, so you're, you're well attuned to laying a wide swath and getting the benefits of the sun for fast drying. Uh, if you're running a mower conditioner and you're leaving a very narrow swath behind it, you can definitely save drying time by upwards of 24 hours. That's a pretty impressive difference. And the faster you can get that material dried down, the more you can reduce those metabolic losses, capture that, that higher quality, and really, really reduce your, your field losses through, through the improved metabolism. So how does it really work? Um, essentially, if you take the same amount of hay and you put it in a very narrow windrow, you're basically shading that material. The sun's rays can't act upon the stomata that allow them to be open to allow it to exchange moisture to atmosphere. If you lay it out very wide, that material that's exposed to the sun will continue through that, that first initial rapid drying where the stomates are very active and pumping moisture out to get that stuff dried down. And that initial boost in drying really is where the advantage is in, in wide swathing from that standpoint. You can see in this, this example that was done at both Arlington and Marshfield back in 05 and 07, that the relative forage quality difference in the same field was 11 points. That was, that was pretty big. The lactic acid, more importantly, was, was 0.8 higher. Now that's interesting because you know I'm, I was told once upon a time that that increase actually made the forage more stable in its bale form. So a lot of advantages to wide swathing beyond just dry time when it comes to quality. Rotary tethers. So a lot of folks uh, around here where I'm from use rotary tethers. We use one our, ourselves. Um, and this study was done by uh, the Cornell Cooperative Extension, essentially back in 2006, and it showed the, the real advantage in, in tedding hay. So the treatment that dried without a doubt the fastest was a tedded narrow swath, right? So we believe there that the, the, the basic reason behind that was that it allowed the stubble and the ground surface to dry off. That moisture didn't have to permeate up through that hay mat. It's dried out, you ted the material out on dry ground, and it was probably the most advantageous. That's what we do here at our farm is we'll narrow swath, and then we'll come through an hour or so later when the stubble's dry and, and spread it out behind. That's how we have the best results, but certainly it's a tool in the toolbox for you to play with. Now, when it comes to field losses, 
this is an additional handling step. It's an additional point in which you're going to be mechanically manipulating that crop. So it's important to keep in mind that if there is a right and a wrong time to TED, particularly in those more delicate crops. For your delicate crops where the value is in the leaf, the drier that material becomes, the less connected the leaf becomes to the stem. And the more handling will actually cause leaf losses to escalate pretty dramatically. So generally, I would never tell anyone, absolutely do not TED a, an alfalfa crop below 40% moisture, because at that point, your, your leaf losses are, are probably incalculable. Um, once upon a time, there were folks that would sell tedders to folks uh, a little bit, and they would say, well, if your crop has been rained on, you know, it's a great tool to knock the rain off, uh, off uh, wet hay. Well, the reality is, if you have alfalfa that's already in a windrow and it gets rained on, the leaching loss is pretty significant, right? Um, if you come through after that leaf has now lost its moisture connection to the stem and you ted it, you can dry it a lot faster, but you're definitely going to be lock, knocking all that leaf off and really dramatically increasing your field losses. So it's not the best tool for that. Uh, some schools of thought are that in grass hay, you could maybe get away with that. Uh, but again, the shatter losses are going to be higher, I believe, even in a grass crop when it's very, very dry and it's been rained on. So a, t a tether fundamentally is a tool to get the material out of the field before it rains, not really a tool to get it out of the field after it's been rained on. Uh, different kinds of rakes. Again, this kind of goes into the handling aspect of things. The more you touch the windrow, the more you touch the material, the more losses you ultimately have from just mechanically handling it. So taking a rake that has the gentlest handling, if you're going to handle the crop, is probably advisable. A uh, rotary rake has some of the gentlest handling out there because of the, the raking action that it provides. Uh, wheel rakes and certainly bar rakes have to repeatedly touch that material to move it from one place in the field to another and what you end up with there is more more loss every time you essentially touch it uh, belt mergers probably do about the least amount of damage from a handling perspective moving the material in a belt it, but it's just not practical to uh, use a belt merger in, in front of most uh, most hay balers today so let's talk hay silage uh, phil had shared with me that a lot of a lot of you folks are making baleage early in the season when you just can't get it dry because the weather's not cooperating. Uh, hopefully we shared some mowing, mowing tips uh, to maybe help reduce that dry down time a little bit for you. But either way, baleage is becoming more and more common for dealing with the moisture conditions that we all seem to face uh, as time goes on. Moisture, as far as how it impacts loss, well, Generally, um, the recommendations I've been told over the years is to make baleage at about 45 to about 60%. So we'll call that about 50 to 55% moisture if you wanted to really, really narrow that down. So if it's too wet or it's too dry, the same results are. You're not getting that ideal fermentation of that material. And at the end of the day, if it's below 30%, you should probably let it just dry down to produce dry hay bales with it because the losses from having or fermentation and mold are, are almost incalculable at that point. You know, today from the New Holland factory, our round balers can be equipped with a factory, factory moisture center sensor that integrates very well into the monitor. It's a really nice touch because as you're, as you're baling along, you know what your moisture is in real time. There are a lot of aftermarket solutions where you can add moisture to your baler. This is an example of something we sell through our service parts group. Um, that actually installs into the baler and then will actually display on your smartphone. So it doesn't even require a, a dedicated monitor and it's, it's, it's not a, a bunch of wires because it communicates uh, essentially via Bluetooth to your phone. Uh, wrapping time. So the time you wrap the hay is really important. If you're doing your early crops as hay silage, if you're having someone come in and rack or come in and tube line and you bail all of your hay up and then 24 hours uh, they show up with the, the the line wrapper or the individual wrapper to wrap your bales you, you're really hurting yourself by that that waiting point you're better off to do it more in, in real time because the sooner you wrap after bailing the lower the bale temperature ultimately becomes so 120 degrees is a pretty handy threshold to remember because anything really above 120 degrees in bale temperature you start to heat bind proteins to the fibers, which basically means they're trapped, they're unavailable to the animals. And if they're unavailable to the animals, then you have to feed more hay to make up for them if you expect the weight gains. 
So just kind of keep that in mind. So what does that really look like? So for every 20 degrees Fahrenheit in bale temperature during fermentation up, you're basically losing about 10% of the available crude protein. Now, this is an example in a dairy ration from some, some years ago now, but the math was based upon replacing that 10% crude protein with soybean meal, and that has a cost. So on a pound for pound basis, replacing it for a 100 cow ration, we figured that would probably cost an incremental $17,000 a year to replace that loss due to bale temperature during fermentation. That's a pretty significant field loss. And that's one that you can put dollars and cents to that make it make it a fairly important one. Now, for most folks, you may not realize, unless you're working with a nutritionalist and testing actively, that you've lost that value, which simply means, Phil, you feed more hay and you have more manure to handle, right? To get the same yeah, benefit. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's it's a pretty straightforward way of thinking about the value of that crude protein in the bale itself. Now, if you're a dry hay producer, uh, I do spend a lot of time on the internet, and these pictures came to me from a farmer that I reached out to when he posted the picture on the right in a conversation about round bales sweating. He posted that picture, and it was the first time I seen a thermometer like that stuck in a bale on the internet in a long time. So I asked him, I said, can you do me a favor? Can you come back to that bale tomorrow, and can you stick the thermometer in it again? So he did, and 24 hours later, that same bale had a bale temperature of 150 degrees. And this is dry, and it was well above 120 degrees. And I, I guess I haven't looked to see if there's a study that validates this point, but if protein binding in silage begins to occur at about 120 degrees, I, I would guess that somewhere around the same area, you start to see the same thing happening in dry hay. So moisture, as much as anything, plays a huge part in it because that's what drives bale temperatures up. Now, 149 degrees is, is pretty significant in temperature, but it's not near a thermal event, right? And this bale would have been considered sweating. The real question is how much quality has been lost through the moisture at which it's been baled at? And should this hay have had preservative applied to it that was going to help keep that bale temperature low? Uh, bale slice is a is a nice feature uh, on a lot of machines. This is one of our answers to cutting hay. There's also rotocutters out there. Um, slicing the hay in concentric rings basically lets you put more hay in every bale. Um, it's really important because it can actually help improve average daily weight gains. I think this was a Penn State study done some some years back. It was 23% greater daily weight gains in yearling heifers, if I remember. But more importantly, it really allows for the reduction of feed waste. When an animal walks up to a ring feeder in particular, reaches in, grabs a mouthful of material, usually there's some hay to the right and the left of the, of the mouth. Once they've chewed that off, the, those ends fall on the ground and the animal tends to step forward onto that material and take another mouthful. That material that hit the ground is, is pure loss. Now, is it field loss or is it, is it bunk loss? Well, I, I think that's probably debatable. Either way, it's a pretty significant loss that can be reduced by, by using a cutter type baler. And if your animals can intake the feed more quickly and they can gain weight more quickly, that really does help pay the bills either way. Pickup adjustments, I'm gonna let Phil speak to you here for a minute. Yeah, so yeah, pickup so look, uh, flotation uh, and pickup height adjustments uh, are both uh, really key. Um, here you can see the baler sitting on a concrete floor, uh, which is really ideal for setting the, the tine height. Um, so minimum tine height is, is one inch, and the higher you can go and still pick up all of that precious hay, uh, the better. Um, we talked earlier about cutting higher and cutting higher allows the crop to sit higher off the ground as it sits on top of that stubble. And so then you can raise uh, your tine height um, as well. And by doing that, you're gonna have less chance of it contacting the ground and um, less chance of picking up stones and packing those in your bale. Um, the other adjustment here is your flotation, and you can see that spring there. And um, so, again, you should be able to pick up 
the pickup um, at around 150 pounds, uh, depending on your baler. Um, the key is that being able to, to raise up when you encounter a, an obstruction. Uh, another thing to think about is, uh, you know, you're probably going to be checking it without any hay in it. And as you um, go through the field and there's hay on that pickup, that's going to add uh, weight to it as well, especially when you're in a, a heavy uh, silage type crop. Yeah, I mean, pickup adjustments really are important to make sure that everything is going right, because if you're if you're not running in the stubble and you're not picking up all that crop, you're leaving it behind. And that certainly is a field loss. Yeah. So this brings us to photo opportunity or oops. Looks so like a big it, oops to me. It, it does. It looks it looks pretty sad and abysmal. So um, I think the reality is it's got to be taken in context, right? So I'm in Pennsylvania. Um, Phil's in Lancaster. I'm up in the Pocono Mountains right now myself. Most of you folks, I would imagine, are in Kentucky. Now, these pictures were taken in the combination of both Wyoming and Texas, right? So crop moisture plays a massive part in this. So the crops got exceptionally dry, and obviously you can see the end result. As that hay comes up into the chamber and it rolls inside the chamber, if it's very, very dry, there's a lot of grinding action that goes on in there, and that can really contribute to your field losses. So uh, the moisture piece is absolutely critically important. Bale density, um, as density goes up, feed quality and bunk life goes up. To the contrary, your consumables, your handling costs, your supplements, and your feed waste, and realistically, labor and facilities costs all go down. So bale density, how much hay you pack in every bale, is critically important. This, I think, was a very interesting thing. Uh, we've thought for years that the slower you bale, the denser the bale would be. Now, it really comes down to the reality that bailing at the right speed for conditions, the thickness of the windrow and the type of material is absolutely critically important. Now, this comes from a study that we did with Penn State a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see the full, uh, the full information at betterbailing.com uh, if, you, if you care to review that. But this shows our baler versus some competitors, and it talks about bailing speed and density. And all but, all but one baler that we compared produced the best density at about a medium speed. Uh, the other really didn't change all that much as far as the density goes. Now, the medium baling speed is just the right speed for the conditions in the field that time, at that time. So in a different crop, in a different condition, you have to use your best judgment to make sure that you're baling and getting the most capacity out of your baler and at getting the greatest amount of bale density out of the product. Good. Well, thank you, Jordan. That um, pretty much concludes our uh, talk here. I do have just a couple other comments. One is that every machine, uh, doesn't matter the brand, is going to come with an operator's manual. And I'd really encourage you to read through uh, your operator's manuals uh, for your various uh, pieces of equipment. Um, because the adjustments that we talked about and showed here in this presentation were on New Holland machines, um, but all the other uh, manufacturers will have similar adjustments, and those will all be described in your operator's manual. So uh, really, it's important to get familiar with the machine, um, all the adjustments, and all of the maintenance um, things with your machine um, to really get the maximum uh, life out of the machine and um, also the maximum productivity. Um, and the other thing too is safety. Uh, reading through the manual, getting familiar with the safety features um, of the machine, um, you know, making sure that if you raise the tailgate of the <clears throat> round baler, that you're you're locking that tailgate out um, if you're working under a mower conditioner that you've got the uh, the transport uh, latches in place um, those types of things um, so read the manual um, get familiar with it 
Um, so again, want to want to thank you for the opportunity that we have uh, here to, to speak to you. And um, at this time, uh, we'll take any questions you might have.